Please take your seat. Okay, we have the last block of uh, gong shows, and uh, the first speaker is uh, Eduardo Garcia Valdecasas. Please. Okay. Well, so uh, well, I thank the colleagues at ICTP and CISA for uh, giving me the, the chance to talk about my, my work. I will be talking about a notion of uh, a, a feature of some quantum field theories that uh, is, uh, can be thought of as the limiting case of uh, higher p-form symmetries, when, in the case of p equals to minus one. And this feature shares some proper, some similarities with the with the usual symmetries, but not all of them. That's the reason why I'm putting here quotation marks, but I will remove them for the rest of the talk. And I will be uh, talking about whether we can think of uh, a spontaneous breaking of these kind of symmetries and what this means and what is the, some, useful, some useful notions that it gives us. Okay, so this is based on the, this paper that appeared earlier in the year with Daniel Aloni, Madris, and Moto Suzuki. I will start with an introduction, then I'll give a toy example in two dimensions. And then we'll graduate to four dimensions where I will bri very briefly talk about SU and Young Mills, QCD, and the strong CP problem. So I told you that uh, the case of P equals to minus one is a bit degenerate. So we will adopt the following definition for the purpose of this talk. I'll say that a theory has a minus one form U1 symmetry if there is a local operator, J0, which can be coupled to a background field which takes values in the circle. So I can write a coupling of this form. Uh, and uh, the property will be that the integral of a star J0 is quantized, and we'll call this the minus one form symmetry charge. The example that I have in mind is a four-dimensional non-abelian gauge theory in four dimensions, where the minus one form symmetry charge is the instant on number. Okay, so in which sense are these symmetries different from their higher p-form counterparts? Well, there is a conserved current, but the conservation equation doesn't really make a lot of sense, at least not in the usual sense, because the conservation equation is tautological. Every top form is closed. Still, the charges are quantized. Topological operators, something similar. They are space-time filling. So it's not very clear in which sense uh, one can introduce them in correlation functions to, for instance, give selection rules. So there are no selection rules. And analogously, there are no charge operators. So there are no selection rules again. Okay, so these three properties uh, are different. And there are some things in which, some ways in which these symmetries are similar to the other ones. In particular, one can couple background gauge fields. So the background gauge fields, you already saw it, is this field theta, which takes values on the circle, and one can think about the periodicity as a large gauge, large gauge transformation for the minus one form symmetry. We can gauge the symmetry by summing over field configurations of theta. And so we understand that a compact scalar field can be thought of as a gauge field for a minus one form symmetry. These uh, symmetries can have anomalies, and they have been studied in the past, and they give interesting constraints on the IR physics of families of QFTs. And finally, uh, what I want to address today is whether we can think about the spontaneous breaking. You may think that this is a bit of a long shot. In particular, there are no charged operators that can take a bet and signal that the symmetry was spontaneously broken, and there is no candidate for a Goldstone boson. Okay. So let me go to the toy model, but before, uh, let me remind you about 4D Maxwell. So it has an electric one form symmetry and a magnetic one form symmetry. They are both spontaneously broken, and it is understood that the photon is the goldstone of this spontaneous breaking. In 3D, there is a similar story, but in this case, the one form electric symmetry is not spontaneously broken. Still, one can uh, see that the zero form magnetic symmetry, which in this case is a zero form, is spontaneously broken. And one can understand the photon and its dual, which is a compact scalar, as the goldstones for this breaking. So then the question is what happens in 2D Maxwell? So in 2D Maxwell, we have a, an electric one form symmetry, which is not spontaneously broken. And in this case, the magnetic symmetry is minus one form. So we can introduce this theta term that I, that I, that I wrote, which is the background field for this symmetry. The 2D photon has no propagating degrees of freedom. And then the question is, in which sense we can think about 2D Maxwell as a theory describing an spontaneously broken magnetic symmetry, which is minus one form, and in which sense the 2D photon is the goldstone of this breaking? So we want to characterize this breaking, but there are no charged operators. So we can try to, oh, sorry, I went a bit ahead of myself. So let me discuss a bit more the physics of 2D Maxwell theory. So we can regulate it by putting it in a circle. Then the uh, theory reduces to the quantum mechanics of a particle in a circle with a magnetic field. The spectrum is well known. Uh, it, uh, 
there are different branches indexed by a quantum number L. And in each branch, the energy depends on theta quadratically. And uh, on top of this vacua, one can put the probe particles. And if one puts two electric probe particles, they will feel an attracting force classically, so they are, which is linear. And so one says that the electric charges are classically confined in two dimensions. Very good. Now, let me try to argue that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. We cannot check any BEF for any charge operators because there are none, but we can argue by analogy. So if we had a zero form symmetry and we wanted to argue that it is spontaneously broken, but we couldn't compute any BEF, one thing we could try to do is to gauge the symmetry and realize that it is in the Higgs phase once we, hage, once, once we gauge it. Then we would say that in the original theory, the symmetry was spontaneously broken. In such a case, the gauge boson will be massive and there will be electric screening and magnetic confinement. So what we can do is gauge the minus one form symmetry in the previous theory into the Maxwell and check if these properties are realized. We gauge the symmetry by introducing this compact scalar field phi. It's easy to get convinced that uh, this field is massive because of the spectrum that I plotted before. And it eats uh, some sort of uh, Goldstone, would be Goldstone field. There is electric screening and one can also get convinced that there is magnetic screening because the magnetic operator, which is a vortex operator, is not gauge invariant. One needs to attach a Wilson line to make it gauge invariant, and I told you that the Wilson lines are confined in two dimensions. So we learned that there is magnetic confinement. So the conclusion is that if we gauge the magnetic minus one form symmetry, it is in the Higgs phase. So we, uh, uh, we say that uh, in the original, we interpret this to mean that in the original 2D Maxwell theory, the the symmetry was spontaneously broken. Okay, I think I'm running a bit out of time. Uh, okay, so we want to find an order parameter. Again, there is no charge operator, but uh, we notice that uh, the, if the energy did not depend on theta, the, the gate symmetry wouldn't have been in the Higgs phase. Uh, what we propose is that the spontaneous breaking of the minus one form symmetry can be uh, diagnosed by an explicit dependence of the vacuum energy on a constant background electric field, uh, on a constant background field theta. The leading dependence is the topological susceptibility. So we propose that the topological susceptibility is, the, is an order parameter for this spontaneous breaking. An interesting uh, link is that uh, the topological susceptibility can also be written in this, in this form. And what this equation tells us is that if the topological susceptibility is non-zero, the two-point function on the right must have a quadratic pole at zero momentum. So this looks a lot like the usual Goldstone theorem, but uh, it's not exactly the Goldstone theorem. Uh, okay, so what we conclude is that uh, this order parameter is related to the masslessness of the photon, which we interpret to be the Hodge dual of the Goldstone boson for this spontaneous breaking. Okay, and we think this story is, uh, is general and it will be universal in any theory that has an spontaneously broken minus one form symmetry in the way I defined it. will have an emergent description in the IR in terms of a topological theory, which includes a D minus one form gauge field. Okay. Two examples of these uh, theories with such a property are SUN Young Mills and QCD. Both theories are, have a minus one form U1 symmetry whose background field is the theta term in four dimensions. They have a non zero topological susceptibility, so the minus one form symmetry is spontaneously broken. And one can get convinced that the Goldstall field in this case is the Chen Simons tree form. In fact, it's known that Arlar Chen, SUN Young Mills, can, its infrared can be described using an effective theory in terms of this Chen Simons tree form, which takes the theory takes this form, which is basically the same as the 2D Maxwell theory that I wrote before. Uh, okay, so let me just conclude by uh, making the link with the strong CP problem. So in our language, theta is physical if the minus one form symmetry is spontaneously broken. Uh, and this is a, an, a requisite for the strong CP problem to arise. The strong CP problem says that theta is very small and physical. So if we are able to prevent this from happening, we will be avoiding the strong CP problem. One can do this in two ways, by either gauging or breaking the minus one form symmetry. And indeed, if one looks at the, some of the solutions that appear to the strong CP problem in the literature, for instance, the action solution or the massless quark solution, one can understand them as having solved the problem by gauging the minus one form symmetry. And something that we also did is to look for new solutions, maybe using uh, anomalies or explicit breaking in the UV, but so far we've been unsuccessful. Okay, and this is uh, some outlook, thanks.
Yes. Uh, so if I understand correctly, um, intuitively speaking, instead of talking about, you know, like I don't know, a minus one form field as the Goldstein boson, you actually introduce a dual field which is like a deform field as the Goldstein boson, right? But it's a d minus one form field. Yes. Y yes. Exactly. exactly. So it's the the Hodge dual. Uh, okay. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay, let's thank Edu again. And the next speaker is... The next speaker is uh, Michael Schultz, please. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak and um, thanks to the organizers for organizing a great event. Um, so today I'm gonna be speaking to you about recent work that appeared on the archive uh, earlier this year with Andreas Melmedier on the themes that are listed here in the title. Um, and so we're gonna start in kind of a strange place for this conference, which is by picking a real number X at random. And since we're picking it at random, it is with 100% certainty going to be irrational since Q has measure zero. But if somebody hands you this number X, how would you actually prove that it is irrational? So if the number is relatively simple, like the square root of two, you could do it by contradiction as we all know, but if your number is more interesting, then that's quickly not gonna work. So one way that you can analyze irrationality is through this Dirichlet irrationality criterion, which utilizes two sequences of rational numbers, satisfying these conditions here, and essentially asking that the ratio converges to x sufficiently quickly to guarantee that x is irrational. So a more interesting class of numbers is that of values of the zeta function. So as opposed to um, values of the zeta function at positive even integers, the zeta values at odd numbers has resisted um, analysis. So in 1978, Roger Appery really shocked the mathematics community by showing that zeta of three was irrational. People didn't know anything about it up to that point. And the way that Appery did this was by, usually, by using the Dirichlet irrationality criterion with these sequences of numbers that appear here. And in particular, these sequences satisfy the same linear recursion relation here. Now these sequences were able to be constructed exactly, in particular, um, the ANs are all positive integers and the BNs are more complicated numbers that are rational, but you can see hints of zeta of three appearing right there. And so while they're constructed exactly, one would still like to know where did these numbers actually come from? So the short answer is that they come from algebraic geometry, though another way to answer this question is to say that they come from modular forms as we'll see a little bit later. To see this, we can apply the Frobenius method, obtaining generating functions of these two sequences, in which case the linear recursion turns into a third order linear differential operator, which is written here in terms of the logarithmic derivative. And then the um, sequence for the ANs gets annihilated by this operator L3, and this is a typo. It should say that gamma um, satisfies a non-homogeneous equation with the operator L3. So the genesis for the geometry that comes out is the fact that this operator is a Calabi-Yau operator. In fact, it's the Picard-Fuchs operator of something that we'll see in just a minute. But if we just had this operator ourselves, we could analyze it. We would see that uh, it is self-adjoint. It's also maximally unipotent at t equals zero, and omega is the unique holomorphic solution at t equals zero that satisfies the kind of integrality properties that you would expect um, from Calabi-Yau's. So the fact that it's maximally unipotent tells us that we have a canonical logarithmic basis of solutions near t equals zero, and the fact that this operator is self-adjoint means that these solutions satisfy a quadratic relation. So we would expect, because it's a third order operator, that omega is the holomorphic period of a pencil of K3 surfaces. And this is indeed the case. So this was shown by Boykers and then later by Boykers and Peters using an integral representation for the series omega. And they showed that you can write precisely omega as the period integral of a K3 surface that's given by this affine equation here, uh, or this equation in affine three space. 
So that's very nice, that's very cool. Um, and one might ask, okay, for the other sequence BN, is there a geometric interpretation of this object? So one way to analyze this question is by finding a fourth order operator that annihilates this series. So a way that you can do this is simply by uh, taking the derivative of this third order operator, and then due to that non-homogeneous equation that we had before, gamma is going to satisfy this homogeneous equation, but this time at t is equal to infinity instead of a zero. And this operator looks pretty nice. It looks like the kind of operators that arise in mirror symmetry for pencils of Calabia threefolds. So one might also ask, because this is a maximally unipotent operator, is this also of geometric origin? And the answer is no, it's actually not. Um, and the reason is because this operator is not self-adjoint. One way that you can see this is that the original three solutions for the previous operator are still solutions of D4 since we've basically just taken the derivative. But let's pretend like we didn't know that. And we just had this operator and we wanted to compute quantities that appear in mirror symmetry for Calabia threefolds, like the holomorphic prepotential, the Ukawa coupling, and instanton numbers. So this is due to uh, results of Wenzi Yang in 2021. And when he computed this, uh, you compute the mirror map as usual. In this case, for the reasons that I was just saying, the mirror map is the same as the mirror map for the pencil of K3 surfaces. But the holomorphic prepotential that you would look at, um, for example, for mirror symmetry of Calabi out threefolds, due to the quadratic relation among the first three solutions, is essentially just going to reduce down to this leading order term. That's really the only interesting thing here. And so I've normalized the coefficient to be one. And so if we define this Yukawa coupling as being the third order derivative of this prepotential with respect to the mirror map, um, we can compute a Lambert-like expansion like we do in mirror symmetry for Calabia threefolds. Now I'm calling these uh, virtual quantities because they really shouldn't be there. This is not a self-adjoint operator, so technically we can't do this, but let's just do it anyways and see what happens. So when Yang did this, he found very surprisingly that we get something that's non-trivial. Um, in fact, we get um, instanton numbers that are integral, and in fact, they're six periodic. But even more surprisingly, this virtual Yukawa coupling is a modular form of weight four for the group gamma naught of six plus. And this is very surprising. This kind of stuff does not happen for um, Calabia threefold mirror symmetry. So Yang looked around for another example and analyzed the dwarf pencil of K3 surfaces given here. And doing a similar story, found two periodic virtual instanton numbers that are given here. So Yang said, there's something happening here, but I don't know what. So in the article that I referenced earlier, what we found is that a common way to organize these examples was into modular pencils of K3 surfaces for the groups gamma naught of N plus for these values of N. And these appeared uh, in particular in the work of Golyshev in 2005 for mirror symmetry of rank one Fano threefolds and later by Golyshev and Zaghi in 2016 in their proof of the gamma conjecture for these rank one Fanos. So the case N equals two uh, corresponds to the dwarf pencil that Yang found. So utilizing results from Goli, Shev, and Zagi, we were able to show that these virtual Yukawa couplings were always weight four modular forms. In fact, they're always uh, rational linear combinations of weight four Eisenstein series. I'm trying to get it to go over there. So this shows, in particular, the modularity, the weight four, the fact that the prepotential is always an Eichler integral for these modular forms, and that these virtual instanton numbers are always going to be periodic integers after normalization. So this appears to show that maybe those virtual instanton numbers are just not so interesting. Yes, we get a modular form, but maybe they don't actually encode anything that would be worth checking out. But we argue that in fact you can get something interesting from these. So in Golyshev's work, this operator that I'm calling the quantum operator D4 appears precisely as the Borel-Laplace transform of the A-side connection on small quantum cohomology of those rank one Fanos, in which these modular K3 pencils that we're looking at are mirrored to the anti-canonical K3s in those Fanos. So generalizing results of Steenstra for instanton expansions of the non-critical string on local threefolds, if we define this quantity capital Q via this equation here, relating it to the period integrals of the mirror K3, 
inverting the equation and then doing uh, another Lambert series type expansion as one would in mirror symmetry, we get something like this and we find some numbers that I'm calling n twiddle. And I'm calling these the dual instanton numbers of the virtual instanton numbers that we had previously. And it's these instanton numbers that I argue actually carry some geometric content. So in all the examples that we analyze, we can find that these dual instanton numbers are in fact integral and they have the candidacy to actually carry some um, real enumerative information. And so we found in the case n equals two, which again corresponds to the dwarf pencil, that after suitable normalization, when you compute these dual instanton numbers, that you find precisely the genus zero Grom of Witten invariance of local P3 as computed by Clem and Penhar Pande in 2007. So we conjecture that such a thing should persist for all of the examples here. And that we should, these dual instanton numbers should be genus zero Grom of Witten invariance of the local Calabiao fourfold. That's the total space of the canonical bundle of those rank one fanos. And we'll end by saying that this sort of um, a result is consistent with Irritani's recent work on the mere symmetric gamma conjecture. Thank you so much for your attention. Is there any question? Yes. Wait. What is please. actually the one that appears in 4 p.m. Uh, black hole scattering? <laughs> so it's exactly the... This one here. That Boykos had. Oh yeah, that's what you mentioned in your talk. I forgot yeah, so to mention actually, that, yes. Uh, quite, quite funny. Yes. And, and actually also the inhomogeneity plays a role. Yes, yeah. right, exactly. In the, in, the, in the following up of the calculation. Yes, thank you for the comment. Okay, one more question. So, um, if I understand, the canonical bundle on, on P3, uh, there being a relationship between gromov witten invariance of that and of the uh, of the uh, of the K three surface, there's some such relation which comes from quantum left shuts, and this is a different relation. Is, what is the relationship between those? <coughs> Um, it seems that it's this local relative relation. Um, in talking to some other people, they've seemed to say that uh, a way to think of this in ter is in terms of relative invariance of the log Calabiao pair in the in P3 corresponding with its anti-canonical divisor. Um, so zeta of three, um, as was mentioned just a minute ago, the, the connection is to that particular K3 surface, which seems to be quite interesting and arise in those ways. Um, and then this seems to be, this sort of behavior seems to persist for these families of, of um, K3 surfaces that are connected to these modular forms. So the zeta of three family happens to be one of those. Because in topological string, zeta of three mysteriously is a kind of a gen, uh, degree zero contribution, which yes. uh, one deduces from indire indirectly, but uh, maybe. And that is, uh, yeah, it is interesting that it arises in that the, context. The proof as well. is that there's a um, hyperconvergency that that upper we used uh, that uh, show that that you uh, that he could use to prove that zeta of three is irrational. So as an uh, uh, probably the gamma class. Maybe we can, uh, you can talk uh, more after the, during the break. So, no, uh, there is no time, I'm sorry. Otherwise, the organizer will kill me. Uh, <laughs> thanks again. So, next speaker. There should be a speaker. Yes. So the next speaker is uh, Irit Hukurvila, please. Hi. Um, thank you for uh, organizing this conference and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, this work is based on an article that was posted recently and one that has yet to appear.
So the main object of study here is the quantum K-ring. It is a uh, Q deformation of the usual K-ring and defined using uh, genus zero K-theoretic gram of Witten invariance. Q here are Novikov variables in indexed by effective curve classes in, in X. One way to describe it is by using two-point invariance to deform the Poincaré pairing and then using three-point invariance to deform the resulting uh, structure constants, which defines us a quantum product. So in particular, the pairing of the quantum product of OY1 with an OY2 with OY3 is the number of genus zero curves passing through Y1, Y2, and Y3. Um, simple example, projective space. The K theory of projective space is determined by um, one minus O of minus one being null potent. Quantum K theory, instead of being null potent, it becomes Q. In general, if you're familiar with uh, quantum cohomology, um, the construction is similar, but it's generally harder to compute quantum K rings. Um, the targets we're interested in today are flag varieties um, in type A. They parameterize flags of subspaces in a larger vector space. Their K theory is described in the following way. The, each subspace in the flag gives you a tautological bundle over the flag variety called SI. And um, these sort of obvious relations um, among the lambda Y classes of these bundles that are on the, on the bottom of the screen here um, wait a sec, are good enough to generate the K ring. So what about the quantum K-ring? Well, in some cases this is known. It's known for full flags, it's known for Grassmannians, and it's known for instance varieties. But in general, we're not sure, but there is a conjecture uh, made by Gu, Mihalcha, Sharp, Xu, Zhang, and Zhou. And it's determined by the following uh, deformation of this Whitney sum formula. And there's kind of a heuristic from physics of why this should be true. Um, it comes from the fact that the quantum K ring is the OPE ring of a certain 3D GLSM. The Wilson line operators here are, correspond to doing kind of Schubert calculus in this quantum K ring. So if you start with uh, sigma times S1 and you apply a Fourier transform, that turns your S1 into a Z, so now your 3D problem is a 2D problem. And then this gives you a twisted super potential. Um, you get quantum K theory from this after picking some churn simons terms. And the superpotential looks like this for those interested. What we care about here is the critical locus of the superpotential. And that's um, given by the equations here for each I. Um, these are called the beta ansatz equations for reasons I won't get into. If you interpret the xij is churn roots of si, or k-theoretic churn roots, then some kind of symmetrization of these things gives you the Whitney relations. Um, so the question we have is, how do we make this rigorous? What do these equations really mean? And the answer comes from abelianization. So, Classically, if you take a GIT quotient, A mod G, for G sum reductive group, we can also consider the abelianization, which is the quotient A mod T by the maximal torus. The K rings are related um, in the following way. There's a surjective map from the Weil invariance of the K ring of the abelianization into the K ring of A mod G. There are some more details here. We don't need them for now. Um, in our case, our flag, flags are GIT quotients in the most standard way you can think of. And the corresponding abelian quotients are um, towers of projective bundles. And essentially the um, correspondence identifies O of minus one on these bundles with some turn roots of the SI. So 
Essentially, one might hope the same thing is true in uh, quantum K-rings. And if you literally copy-paste everything in the conjecture, not quite. But um, the, one of the ways of handling this is to twist the quantum K-ring on the abelian side, which means you define your gamma witten invariants using a different uh, virtual structure sheaf. So the appropriate conjecture is that after doing this, you also have a um, surjective map. So this conjecture is true in the case of flag varieties. And when you calculate stuff on the abelian side, you get things that give, correspond to the beta ansatz equations, um, provided you interpret the xij as the appropriate tautological bundle. So the wild group is Sn. So symmetrization of these do descend to relations back onto your flag. There's some work involved here, that's why I put a star, um, but it can be done. And so that ends up proving the Whitney conjectures that they do in fact give you a presentation of the quantum carrying of flags. Thank you again for organizing this conference. Thank you. Any question? Um, this comes from the uh, like Yang Baxter side. If you think of this, um, the compact limit of the Yang Baxter story for uh, T star flags, <coughs> the um, equations are the beta ansatz equations from there. So from that perspective, you can think of what I'm doing as explicitly calculating which uh, deformations of the um, tautological bundle you get. Um, I think uh, Christian Quark told me something like this once, but I forgot what he said. No, 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 it's not, no, it's, 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 um, it's the spectral dual, so it's not the Q-tode. Um, Q-tode is what you get if you start varying yeah, that's, color that's parameters. Q-tode is the full flag. No, no the, the, so if you, if you take cotangent bundle to flag varieties, this is X, X, Z spin chain for, for, for SUN, when N is the length of the flag. Uh, but no, if you I, take the limit, it's kind of, I don't know what it is, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I, I, I know there's, I think there's some way to describe this also in the compact limit, but I, I don't know what it is. Any more question? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, the next speaker is uh, Tommaso Maria Botta, please. Great, thank you very much for the, for the opportunity. So yeah, today, so today's talk, which is based on joint work with Ben Davison, is about, the, so two Lie algebras that naturally arise in, in connection with string theory and quantum field theory, namely the Malikonkov Lie algebra and the BPS Lie algebra. So since it's kind of late, then I will start with, uh, with, with two tails from the 20th century. So let's fix, uh, fix a quiver, Q, with, without one loop, so that's just for now. So we can then define its, okay. We can then define its generalized character matrix. So this is an example, for instance. And we all know that out of it we can get a, we can produce a Lie algebra, a Katz-Moody Lie algebra, and we can define it over Q, and it has its standard triangular decomposition. And another thing we know is that whenever we have a quiver, it might be relevant starting uh, quiver varieties, so as those defined in previous talks. So it's a simplex reduction of the cotangent bundle of the space of representations of the frame quiver. 
And well, what Nakajima thought is in, in the 90s is that if we consider the direct sum of the cohomologies of all the queer varieties, then there's a canonical morphism, morphism of algebras from the universal enveloping algebra of the Katz-Moodley algebras to the endomorphism of this cohomology. And so this mean, effectively means that we can produce representations of Katz-Moodley algebras out of geometry. So that's one cool story. It led off tons of new directions in geometric representation theory. And another in interesting story that from the last century is the one of Katz polynomials. So morally, uh, Katz taught us that we might want to count isomorphism classes of representations of, uh, of, of, of our quiver Q. And in particular, if we count them right, namely if we count isomorphism classes of absolute and decomposable representations, that we get some numbers that are really, really interesting and cool. And so from a representation theory perspective, one of the reasons why we might we want to study these numbers is the so-called Katz constant of conjecture, now a theorem by Hausel, Thomas Hausel, and which means that if we pick some specific root space of our Katz-Moodley algebra, then the constant term of the Katz polynomial recovers its dimension. So, okay, but now we are in the 21st century, so we might ask ourselves new questions. So, what if we want to recover the whole Katz polynomial, so not only its constant term, and what if we want to allow one loops in our quiver? So, what if we want to consider some, something like this? So, we want to allow loops or even multiple loops based at some vertex. Well, if so, then the result, resultantly algebra, algebra must be z graded. Well, that's because we want to recover the whole Katz polynomial, Katz polynomial. And in addition, we want to take care of three kind of vertices. So there are real vertices, so those without loops, those we are used to. Isotropic vertices, so those vertices which exactly want a loop, like the one in green the here. And finally, hyper hyperbolic vertices. Um, namely those with, with at least one loop. So you see that there's a difference in the Cartan matrix. So the entries vary according to the type of the vertex. Well, so this is not more the realm of katz moodley algebras anymore, but rather the realm of generalized katz moodley algebras, so also known as Brochersley algebras. So of course I could write down uh, the definition of these uh, Lie algebras, but that would be kind of mean now in the afternoon, so I will just give you a feeling about them. So the idea is that they are still generated by some kind of generalized triples, E, H, F, those we are used to, but we have to be careful because, for instance, if a vertex is isotropic, then these are the relations of these three, of, of these three um, base elements are not modeled on SL2, but rather on the three-dimensional Heisenberg Lie algebras, which, is, uh, which means nothing but the fact that in this case, H is central. And in addition, of course, we have cell relations, but cell relations now will apply only if the vertex I is real or whenever the uh, Tij is equal to, to, to zero. So in particular, for instance, if we have a, a vertex which is hyperbolic, then we don't have several relations there. Well, okay, so this is some, these are some cool algebraic facts, hopefully cool, but you might ask, so how do we construct them, and especially how do we construct them from geometry? And the answer here, well, there are two possible answers. And they go under the name of Malikunkov theory and cohomological algebras. So let's analyze them separately first. So Malikunkov theory is a gadget developed around, around 15 years ago that arises in connection with Gromov-Witten theory of quiver varieties. And in particular, it produces a Lie algebra and a Yangian, this is the Mauli-Kunkov Lie algebra, and this is the associated Yangian, which is a quantum group, living and acting in, on quiver varieties. And essentially, both the Lie algebra and the Yangian are reconstructed from the braiding of its category of representations. So, the, effectively, the geometrically, uh, the geometric gadget that it's used to define these uh, uh, Lie algebra and algebra are the so-called stable envelopes, which are certain uh, operators, Steinberg actually correspondences acting on quiver varieties on their, on their cohomology that uh, produce a triangular decomposition of the air matrix. 
And we also have a, tri a, the a triangular decomposition of the associated Lie algebra, the molecule of Lie algebra, which is what we would expect from the theory of generalized scale smooth Lie algebras. And finally, so one of the reasons why this is relevant is that if we want to control the quantum multiplication on queer varieties, we cannot just consider like a Katzmudili algebra, but we need this whole larger object. And so this is, for instance, the formula for the quantum multiplication that, as you see, depends on certain uh, um, invariant, um, invariant tensors in the universal number of big algebra of this Lie algebra. So this is one story, and another story is the one about uh, the, the, the story of cohomological algebras. So these also have geometric origin in the sense that essentially they categorify the T-theory for Jacobi algebras. But for us, let, let, let's see. Uh, so for us, essentially, there are some B algebras produced out of geometry that are defined as follows. So essentially, they are the borel moore homology of the moduli stack of representations uh, of the, uh, the zero locus of the moment map. So the multiplication and the action of queer variety is defined geometrically by means of some echo correspondences. And there's a generalized Katzmudi Lie algebra, the so-called BPS Lie algebra, that essentially uh, governs the algebraic stru structure underlying the cohomological algebras. And finally, last but not least, the Katz polynomials are recovered by the greater dimension of, these root, of the root spaces of the BPS Lie algebra. So, okay, so we have two geometrically interesting uh, Lie algebras that, uh, that we can, might, might try to compare. And indeed, it's been, since the origin of this Lie algebra, it's, it's always been thought that they have, one has to do with, so they, they should be related somehow. And actually, the main result I want to present today exactly explains uh, the relation. And actually, that's the strongest relation possible. So we have an isomorphism between the molecule of Lie algebra and the BPS Lie algebra up to fixing the, the base field where they are defined and model some center. And this inter intertwines the natural actions on cohomology of queer varieties. So in particular, the molecule of Lie algebra is a generalized Katzmudi Lie algebra, which is something that you cannot see directly. And there are two main corollaries of the story that uh, have, have been also re reproved by Schliefman and Vassero recently. Uh, and that is the, first of all, that there is an isomorphism between the cohomological algebra and the positive part of the Yangian, which also intertwines the action on queer varieties. And finally, Okunkov's conjecture that states that the greater dimension of the molecule of Lie algebra uh, recovers, once again, the Katz polynomials. It's kind of surprising in many ways. So, uh, well, in principle, I could spend a few words about the proof, but I think it's time to ask whether there are questions, and thank you for, for listening. Is one question there? Any any specific physics context that these apply to? That, 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 that's the question I fear the most. Because <laughs> uh, um, the objects you're dealing seems to be very interesting for us. I just don't see the context. Right, right, absolutely. So, so I mean, in, in a sense, as I said, this multiple algebra and the whole story associated with it. It's something that controls uh, quantum cohomology of queer varieties, so modular space of uh, Higgs, so, uh, Higgs branches of 3D and equal four theories. And uh, on the other hand, the, so the, the BPS uh, Lie algebra is something that should, as I said, it's something that comes from DT theory. Uh, and so because of this, BW type isomorphism, essentially the great dimension of the Koha should recover the Gopal Kumar Waffen invariants, but uh, that's, uh, that's essentially what I, I'm feeling confident enough to say here in front of everyone, then maybe we can discuss more later. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Okay, we have one last speaker. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, the last speaker of the session is Justin Kulp. Please, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for having me here today, and uh, thanks to all the previous speakers. I'm not gonna talk about something nearly as fancy. I'm gonna talk about uh, stuff which is presumably entirely in Peskin and Schroeder, if you look at it the right way. I, so most of the work I'm going to be talking about today is in a uh, recent paper with Davide Gaioto and Jing Sheng Wu, but also there's relevant earlier works with Kasia Budzik, Brian Williams, and Matthew Yu. And so here's the papers down at the bottom. So in particular, what I wanna argue today is that quantum field theories have collections of higher multilinear K area operations, colloquially called brackets, like in equation one. And these brackets control deformations, operator product expansions, and uh, anomalies of quantum field theories. And they satisfy various consistency relations, kind of generalizing Jacobi identity. And if you're familiar with words like factorization algebras, then there's factorization algebras, operads, and infinity algebras lurking underneath here, but I'm not gonna address them directly, but if you're familiar with these words, then, then maybe you'll see something else. Uh, these structures are actually very familiar to high energy physicists and mathematicians who've studied twisted uh, supersymmetric quantum field theories, especially in the context of descent relations or even string field theory, but I'm not exactly an expert on string field theory. And indeed, as uh, that kind of implies, we can go very far in holomorphic or topological scenarios. So if uh, people want to switch to their laptops or fire out a few tweets, um, this is the three main takeaways before you leave, is that quantum field theories have these higher brackets and they're just defined by something that I'll call the eta vector. These brackets are very computable. I really want to stress that. And they encode anomalies and operator product expansions. And then at the end, I'll flash very quickly a non-renormalization theorem in holomorphic topological scenarios. Okay, so let's start with the eta function. So given a quantum field theory T, it can be deformed, uh, at least perturbatively, by turning on interactions. And I've, I've schematically drawn that here in equation two. And in this case, the couplings GI, they're kind of like coordinates on this theory space on, uh, of like effective quantum field theories. And in this talk, I'm going to work to all orders in perturbation theory. So every function you see of GI should be understood to be a, a formal power series in these GI. Now, a generic quantum field theory famously, or a point, is not scale invariant. So if you do a scale transformation on the theory, then what that's going to do is we, what we do is we, we, we effectively trade that for a change of the couplings. And we encode this change of the couplings in terms of uh, uh, this change of the couplings uh, generated by these scale transformations in the form of a beta function. So here's a beta function here in expression three. And uh, as promised, the coefficients are a formal power series. And sort of the first, the, the first term, the linear term in the coefficient or in the beta function kind of tells you about classical violations of, of scale symmetry. And the higher order terms tell you about, in scare quotes, quantum mechanical violations of, of uh, scale symmetry. So why did I tell you all that? Well, I told you all that because an often underappreciated point is that you can compute the analog of the beta function for any type of transformation. So for example, non-relativistic scale transformations are something very popular right now. And in this talk, what I wanna do is I wanna consider my quantum field theory T, but described in a BVBRST formalism. So it's embedded in a larger theory, T twiddle, and T twiddle is uh, some large ambient theory with ghosts, anti-ghosts, possibly anti-fields if you're going full BV. And it has some sort of odd nilpotent symmetry, QBRSD. And the observables in T are recovered from T twiddle, essentially by definition, by taking the QBRSD cohomology. And then what I want to understand today is I want to deform T by deforming T twiddle, but without breaking this BRST symmetry. Okay? And in this case, the BRST symmetry, just 100% analogous to the scale transformations, will be encoded instead in an eta function instead of a beta function and I've drawn it here in expression five. And exactly analogous to the beta function, the linear terms of these coefficients will tell us if an interaction calligraphic I explicitly violates BRST symmetry. And higher order terms are going to tell us if it does so uh, quantum mechanically. Now, because Q squared or QBRST squ squared is zero, then it follows that the eta function squares to zero. And this gives a whole collection of quadratic constraints on these coefficient functions. So this is the most general coefficient function here in expression six. I haven't used the quadratic constraints to simplify it in any way. And what I'll do is, is I'll define the following multilinear operation on the space of interactions. So I've just defined it here in equation seven. It looks like I'm just defining a Lie algebra, but it eats, it eats arbitrarily many entries or n many entries, and it uses as structure constants the coefficients of this eta function. In that case, a simple calculation shows that the BRST variation looks like this Markov-Tan equation here in expression eight. 
And so the BRST variation is just this Markartan equation. But then if I'm saying Markartan equation, I must mean Markartan equation for something. And that something, as it turns out, is an L infinity algebra. So indeed, the, f the statement that e to squared is zero is exactly equivalent to the statement that these coefficients and the brackets that I've defined define an L infinity algebra on the space of interactions. And uh, what I really want to stress is that these brackets are uh, computable. So if you use Q on any interaction, it's going to take this form. It's going to be sort of a rotation in the space of interactions, plus possibly this total derivative dj, which is invisible to the integrals because, you know, you, 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 you integrate uh, when you put in an interaction. And so, of course, it's always going to take this general form. And then if I work in some sharp cutoff regularization scheme, well, first let's just talk about there's going to be, a, of course, a single bracket of just one single calligraphic i, and that's just going to be like the, the original uh, Q acting on math cal i. And then the two bracket has just this very nice form. It's a very simple formula, and so it is truly computable. And for example, you can see if you just use all the definitions I provided, that uh, if you take, for example, a 2DG gauge theory, and some matter theory with G-global symmetry, for example, free fermions with a, a vector current or something like that. Then you can open up Peskin and Schroeder and you can, you can see how do you add ghosts, how do things vary, and you can study the interaction, uh, the usual A wedge J interaction that in scare quotes, like gauges the G-global symmetry of the matter theory. And indeed, if you, you know, use this formula here I've written in expression nine, it's, it's a straightforward example, actually. In fact, uh, I would show it if we had more time. It's very straightforward to just see, you plug this in, and the two bracket I, I of this A wedge J interaction exactly recovers the well-known one loop anomaly for G gauge theory. Uh, and you could imagine that if I was working in 2K dimensions that uh, I would get, you know, F wedge, F wedge, F wedge, F, et cetera. And this little pound sign out front just points out that, you know, I ignored various combinatorial factors which possibly might some, or, give zero if I had uh, chosen all my matter and representations correctly. <clears throat> all right. And then I can also talk a little bit about some generalizations. So I've kind of told you already about the, the eta function, which is sort of the analog of the beta function, but I can systematically compute corrections. I, I, I mean, there's sort of an analog of the anomalous dimensions. And so indeed that's represented by this bold Q here. And this lets me systematically compute corrections uh, to Q acting on local operators. So it's given by a similar simple form. And this simple form is very useful for computing perturbative corrections to BPS operators and twisted SQFTs. This is sort of generalizing how the Kanishi anomaly corrects, uh, gives corrections to the chiral ring in, in, uh, in supersymmetric quantum field theories. We can also consider position-dependent interactions. So in that case, there's momentum inflow at each vertex, and the space of interactions uh, gets a little subscript PI. That and this sort of reflects the momentum-colored operad structure, if those words mean anything to you. There's a very special case of this when holomorphic momentum can flow in at the vertices. Uh, and this recovers the case of lambda brackets or n Lee or homotopy conformal algebras. These lambda brackets are already show up in, you know, standard VOAs. And finally, in our paper, we also study auxiliary boundary and defect systems. And indeed, for example, if you study some chiral VOA, all OPE coefficients of the VOA can basically be obtained from studying these brackets and also the brackets of the system with some decoupled free fermions. So indeed, lots of the information, essentially all of the information is in these brackets. So in the remaining minute, I'm just gonna flash some quick results, very quick, about the holomorphic topological theories. So by holomorphic topological theory, let me just be fast, I just mean a theory on CH times RT, where anti-holomorphic translations in the CH are Q exact, as are all translations in the topological direction. And I'm generally interested in theories of this very broad form here in uh, equation 14. And as kind of promised on the previous slide, in such theories we'll be interested in brackets which take the most general form like this, where holomorphic momentum is allowed to flow in at the, at the vertices. Uh, it's not obvious, but the Feynman integrals that contribute will take this general form. Actually, this form is very straightforward. It just says, you know, integrate over the position of all the vertices, holomorphic momenta is allowed to flow in, take a product of all the propagators, regularized. This little d is maybe the only thing you weren't expecting, but that's roughly because we're interested in the Q of things, and there's various descent relations that relate d to Q. It's okay. It's uh, just a nice straightforward formula. 
And uh, I, I'm going to suppress the details, but it's actually not very difficult. Just simply by counting form degrees of the integrand and the things contributing to it, one can show that all non-vanishing Feynman diagrams take the form of what are called n Lamann graphs. And here I've drawn some pictures of two Lamann graphs. And so these would be relevant, for example, if you had one holomorphic direction or two topological directions. And then uh, I'm run out of time, so I'll just flash this extremely quickly, is that uh, it turns out that the Feynman integrals associated with them satisfy various quadratic identities. These quadratic identities essentially enforce the associativity relations or the fact that QBRST squared is equal to zero in a diagram by diagram way. In one of our papers, we show that, at least in the n equals two case, that you can bootstrap it seems all the Feynman integrals just from these identities, so you don't actually have to compute these things. And indeed, a purely graphical proof on these very restricted class of diagrams on the previous slide can be used to argue that uh, all loop graphs in theories with greater than or equal to two topological directions must vanish. Uh, so with that, you can scan this code and you can look at the paper because that was probably a bit fast. Sorry for going over. Uh, any questions? Comments? Wait for the microphone. So can you uh, apply this, if you apply this to two-dimensional Lando-Ginsberg models with a superpotential massive, do you see anything like the, is there any relation to the operatic structure that you see on the solitons? Uh, I mean, I assume you're also talking about this web-based formula yeah, yeah. of your paper. Yeah. Uh, I understand it's extremely closely related, but I don't have anything super concrete prepared. Okay, the other question is, um, I think in, from factorization algebras, we expect local operators to have some kind of EN structure. Uh, that's right, that's right, yeah. And so do you think you can recover that from this? Uh, yeah, actually we have a whole section in the, in the paper talking about the relationship between Okay, these. cool. Yeah. yeah, section six, check it out, people. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this quadratic relation, do you have a um, geometric interpretation of them? Because uh, they look similar, like this Griffiths transversality conditions. Sorry, what was the last part? They look similar to? They look similar to this Griffiths transversality condition. So why, why are they quadratic? Um, I mean, what is the geometric interpretation? What is the interpretation of this quadratic? Ah, okay, so the interpretation is described in uh, the oldest of the papers, and um, it can sort of be related to the configuration space of the various graphs that appear, um, but it's, uh, it's a bit involved. I mean, I could go into, for example, how you might use equation 16, but to actually that describe the imagine, con uh, configuration space might be. They look so similar that uh, I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably related, but. Yes, it enforces it on the nose, order by order, basically, in perturbation theory, yeah. I have a question. Uh, is there some physical interpretation of zeros of these eta functions? Yeah, they're BRST invariant theories, basically. Okay. Yeah. okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so this is the end of the gong show. Let me remind you that at 